know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here is your host, Reverend Jeff Peterson. Well, the study today is a good operation. When I think about a farm or a business, I always think about what is a good operation where, where everything is all set up in such a way that, that everything's going to flow nicely and, and we're going to be able to work proficiently and efficiently. I think as a little kid, my mother used to always read me books like Old MacDonald and, and books about farms and things like that and how, well, when I was a little kid, farming basically was you had kind of the, the full service farm, so to speak. Like here you had a barn where you had the milking cows and the hay mow. And over here you had a barn with beef cattle. And then you had over here another barn with, with pigs and a chicken coop. Then you had the house and the machine, the machine shed. But everything had its place and everything was very functional. It was a good operation and the farmer had a certain acreage to be able to raise crops and so there was hay and corn and oats and beans. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. And so that's the way that I remember growing up because growing up in a town where basically the whole countryside was just um, peppered with dairy farms. That's kind of the way the setup was. But now today, farming has become more specialized. It seems like now you have just huge dairy operations or, or huge hog operations or beef, or some are just uh, simply into crop farming. And so whatever the operation is, and then of course we always think of the small business and how that's all organized where you know, you have your appliances over in this section of the store and toys in that section of the store and clothing and it's all highly organized. And so as people come into the store and, and they say, well, I need a tool. Well, that's over there in this section of the store. Or if I need a pair of uh, jeans, well, you go over there. And so everything is all set up. And, and so God is a God of order. God has created the world in life in order. And the only thing that brings disorder is sin. I mean, everything is so perfect. I mean, everything is like clockwork. So perfect. We got so many problems. And so I'm going to read to you a parable, and it's the parable of the evil farmers. And so I'm, I'm going to read this to you right now. And it's from Mark chapter 12. Uh, verses 1 through 12. He then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the vine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on, on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir, come. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him 
out of the vineyard? What then will be the owner of the vi- what then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. And so here we have the man who has the vineyard, and that's God. And as far as the the tenants, that would be his people, the religious people. And then as far as those whom he went to to come and, and take, you know, a share of the prophets, that would be the priests and the prophets, and finally his son Jesus. Okay, but just the way that this is described, it's, it's, a, it's a vineyard. And that was one of the, the vocations back then. It was one, one of the agricultural things was having a vineyard where grapes were then crushed to make wine. And so we can see where it's all set up, that, that this man had his acreage, he had all of his um, vines, all, all nicely dressed. He had a, a wall around his vineyard, and that was a boundary to protect his vineyard from just about anything. It was a wall to protect his vineyard from having, oh, like, uh, while having animals come in and, and eat his crop. It was to keep you know, thieves from coming in and stealing you know, the, the produce. He actually had a watchtower so that he could go up and just to make sure that as he looked around that everything is okay within the vineyard and without the vineyard or from without, outside of the vineyard. And so everything was a good operation. And then he had his wine press where he could go and he could crush the grapes and then make the, the juice into, into wine. And that's you know, pretty much how they would preserve grape juice back then. Because they didn't have any refrigeration, that they would ferment it. And so it was quite a business. I know I've been to Palestine and I didn't go to a vineyard, but I did go to a place where they raised olives. And I was able to be part of the the picking of the olives. And that was quite an experience of how they would do that. They would have these kind of ladders that you go up into. And and you have like these little toy rakes. And that's how what you would do is scrape the branches and all of the olives. And then there would be these tarps underneath the trees. And so all of the olives would then land on the trees, or excuse me, all all of the the olives from the olive trees would then land on these tarps. And then when you, as soon as we were done uh, getting all the olives, picking all the olives and getting them, then we would uh, collect them into the tarps. And we would put them into big uh, barrels, plastic barrels. And then we would take it to the market, to the place where they would take the olives and then they would make it into olive oil. And so we saw the whole process from where they would put the um, olives into this machine and how the machine would process it. And at the end, there was a big spout where the olive oil was just coming out. And then they would then be able to, you know, here again, put, put the olive oil, they would put it into big jugs and then eventually be taken to where then it would be put into smaller jars and bottles where then it would be sold. And so it's always kind of interesting to be part of a process like this. But let's first of all look at, when we think of creation, we think about a story like this. We think of the first order of creation, and we're going to talk about the second order of creation, 
or the second order, and then the third order. And so what I want to talk about as far as being the first order of creation is creation itself. And like I already mentioned, I mean, when we study creation, it's just amazing. I mean, all the physical laws that are in place, and how thankful we are, so that we can know that you know, our environment around us, that when springtime comes, that this is the time that we can plant the seeds, and then there's going to be a, a warm season where the, where the seeds will, will grow and and. And so the heat, you know, will, will allow, in the humidity, will allow those plants to grow. Until finally in the fall, there will be that time of harvest. And then there's uh, the winter season of dormancy. But still, everything has got its, everything is in order. Everything has its cycles and its seasons. And so that we can, you know, not so much predict, but that we can count on and that we can know that this is what will be happening. And so that's the first order of creation for which God has placed humans in this creation to be the stewards. Now here again, there's all kinds of living creatures. You know, there's all the different spe species of animals, all the vegetation, and God has placed us in charge. We are the stewards. I mean, God is the owner. We are the stewards. And so we think about the stewardship of science. We think about the stewardship of agriculture and farming, the stewardship of medicine, the stewardship of teaching, the stewardship of building, the stewardship of, um, of infrastructure and maintaining. I mean, that's where we're all called to vocation, that we all have some kind of a vocation in this world where we are responsible. And so think about that vocation, that God is the owner and that, that we are in this vocation, but yet sin has come into this world, and so we now have wanted to X God out. We want to be the owner. And so, whatever it is, you know, we don't praise God, we don't thank God for, for everything, but rather we want to take credit. It's almost like we created or we invented the world and we invented seeds and we invented how they grow and, and that we take all the credit for somebody else's work. Okay, so that's where we want to be God. We want to sit on the throne and you know, certainly we've known throughout history examples of evil dictators you know, who want to rule the world or even totalitarian kinds of governments where they want to rule the world or we can even just see in our own communities, in our own lives where, you know, you know this person in the neighborhood certainly wants to somehow feel like they are the authority and have control over all of us and, and that just isn't healthy. And none of us likes that. But part of the concern that I have right now is that as we're working with this, the more and more I'm seeing how robots are coming into our society and they're taking over the stewardship of what we are to do. And so that really does devalue our humanity, where we begin to feel as a humanity, well, what is our role in creation anymore? You know, God has created us to be the stewards, the caretakers, but now it seems like the robots are in that position, and we're going to be seeing that more and more. And so that's what's kind of sad, is that people who would work hard in their jobs and would take a lot of pride in their jobs, and we would look forward to seeing them as we go different places, that all of a sudden now, oh, it's all robotic. It's all automized. And so that really what concerns me is that, you know, the whole stewardship of what God has called us to do is now being, it's now jeopardized. I mean, after a while, what are people going to do? What, what is our function? What is our role? But one of the things that we have to always acknowledge is that God is the creator. And that we are the stewards, that we are the caretakers, and so that's what we need to be doing, doing the best job that we can 
to work with God, to work in and with creation. And so that means that we're concerned about all of creation. You know, it's concerning that we have the threat of global warming and, and how that threatens all life in this world. But the good news and the hopefulness is, is that we are now working more and more on green energies. That's going to be more eco-friendly. But we also look at animals. You know, we can't look at animals as being the enemy. I mean, we kind of treat all a animals as if they are, you know, these evil creatures in the world. You know, whether it's a skunk or a snake or a bear, you know, they're not evil. God has placed them in our creation because they all have a role to play. And if all of a sudden we got rid of all the snakes, well, that's really going to throw our whole environment you know, out of balance. Or the same thing if we get rid of all the bears or all the wolves or whatever it is, all of the, the sea lions. And so we have to be really concerned about taking care of the animal kingdom and making sure that we preserve their habitat. That's what God has called us to do. It is a spiritual matter. And we can say, oh yeah, you know, I got Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior and all that, but I can care less about the animals. Well, Jesus, as your personal Lord and Savior, wants you to go out and to be concerned about your environment. Not only for your own personal sake, but for everybody's sake. That's what your personal Lord and Savior is calling you to do this day. To become environmentally conscious. You know, one of the things about studying Native American culture is that, you know, when, when we came over, the white people, the Europeans, so to speak, <clears throat> that they just couldn't understand how, you know, that we, you know, fight and get our land and that we that we own property. For them to say, no, God has created all things. And we are the stewards. And <laughs> that the woods are for all of us to go and hunt in. The fields are for all of us to raise our corn. That we work together as a community. We're not individuals. And that was one of the hardest things for the Native Americans as we came over is that it was just a complete different understanding of of how to go about uh, creation and society. They say, well, to own a piece of property? No, God owns. God owns the forest. God owns the fields. God owns the sky. God owns the lakes. God owns the rivers. And we're to take care of them. We all are allowed to hunt. We are all allowed to farm. We are all allowed to you know, to live in this beautiful place. But that's all part of the story, is that we want the vineyard. And we see it's the damaging consequences as a result of this attitude. So that's, you know, what I would call the first order of creation, and that we are called to be the stewards of the earth, and we better be doing our very best to be taking care of this beautiful creation and life that God has given to us. You know, not only so that it'll be healthy for us in this day, but hopefully, you know, making it a better place for the generations to come. And I believe that we can do it. And I would really encourage, you know, solar energy and wind energy and hydro energy and, you know, all these different ways, you know, that we can be learning how to you know, go about having our modern technology, but where we're not destroying our creation as a result of having it. But then the second order would have to do with just what we're talking about here. Is that the religious leaders, that they wanted to control, they, it's like, you know, we want God out of, we want God out of everything. We got our laws, we know how to, how to go about things. We want to be in control. We want to be in authority. We want everything for ourselves. We want all of the blessings. 
And so as the prophets and the priests were coming and wanting justice, well, they are wanting an offering that can be used to honor God and to be helping the poor and the sick and, and those who are around us who are, who are needing the mercy of God. It would be giving of our time, our talents, and possessions. They didn't want anything to do with it. We are in charge. We know how to operate as God, so to speak, as God's, as the religious leaders. And the idea here is that the sun comes. Jesus comes. And the idea is that if we just kill the sun, then we will be the heirs. The vineyard will be ours. And so that's what they did, is that they, they crucified Jesus. But the second order of creation, then, is that as creation has fallen, as I would mentioned, is that now creation in Jesus Christ, that we can be reborn, that we can be redeemed, that we can be reconciled, that we can be restored to, to life. That as we have life with God, and as that then became lost in, our, in the fall of sin, that now it's all been redeemed, it's been restored in Jesus. And so that's the good news, that to say, well, that I have fallen to sin, and I cannot free myself, but it is Jesus who is the bondage breaker, who does save me. That Jesus is our Savior. And so that's all part of the stewardship of the gospel. It's to say that, yes, you know, that was the most evil thing that's ever happened in the history of the world, is that we have crucified the Savior Jesus. But yet, in that, God had a plan. That in that, that God has taken the most awful thing that has happened in the, in the world, and has now has made, turned it into what is the greatest thing that has ever happened in the world as far as the resurrection. And so that's one of the things that we always have to say, and maybe, you know, kind of a simplistic way of looking at it, is that God takes our negatives and turns them into positives. I mean, if we look at the cross, the cross is the big plus sign. And as humanity is operating and working for, you know, for destruction and evil and for their own selfish purposes, that, that God is working his, reconcilia his reconciliation in, in all of this. That God redeems us. You know, that word redemption is so special. Redemption, well, in my understanding of it, is that when something or someone has value, and then th that value has been lost, but now that value has been restored. You know, I just, you know, look at a pop can that's filled with, with pop. You know, I'll buy, and I use that because I'm one who will go into the store and I'll buy a can of pop. But when I drink its contents, all of a sudden now that can has lost its value. But now, if I bring that can to the redemption center or the recycling center, it now has been redeemed. It now has value again. But I think with life, that God has given to us value, but because of sin, I've lost my value, and I feel bad, I feel guilty, I feel sick about it. But in Jesus Christ, I'm forgiven. And that God gives me the opportunity to redeem my life, to restore the value once again. And so as God's people rejected Jesus, that Jesus says that the very stone that the builders have rejected has now become the cornerstone. And what, is that, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is now the cornerstone or the foundation of the church. And that's, I guess, where I call now the third order, is that God now has established the church. And the church is the place where we come and we gather into God's house, where he welcomes us to his, his table, 
where we receive his life-giving body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. It's there that we gather to hear the word of God. It's there that we gather to encourage one another as we live our lives in faith. It's there that we, that we work on ministry, ministry projects that not only support you know, the members of the church, but also then as we leave the church that we go out and we serve the Lord, that we go and reach out to the ends of the earth. And so this is where, where the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit creates faith within us, and so that we live and that we walk by the Spirit, and how God encourages us that we make our faith active in love. And so that's uh, what God now has called us to be, is that as people who are, have been redeemed, people who uh, Jesus has died for, that we now have been reconciled and that we have been brought into and made together being the church of God. And so how special that is. And so that gets us back to the stewardship, is that as we are the stewardship of creation, that God now has given to the church the stewardship of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ that we share. That God has given to us the stewardship of the ministry. And that in all that we do, that we, that we do it to the Lord, that we do it to the glory of God, and not for self. That never, never is the church the platform for me to have the spotlight to say, oh, it's all about me. No, it's not about me. It's about God. And we always have to keep that perspective so we don't fall into the trap of these evil farmers. So that we always know that the church is God's vineyard and it's there that we gather together to bear the fruit, the fruit that we offer to God in thanksgiving to God and that we use then for the ministry into the ministry of the lives of those around us. And so how precious it is to be called, to be called the children of God, called together to be the branches connected to Jesus, the vine, bearing the fruit for his kingdom. You have been watching To Know Christ with Reverend Jeff Peterson pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. The worship schedule for the Lutheran Church of Peace is Saturday night at 6 p.m. and Sunday morning at 9 a.m. A collection of Pastor Peterson's Christian books can be found at Amazon.com. His latest book is called Sharing Our Faith in the Covenant of God's Grace. Thank you for watching and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.